Welcome to the Workology Podcast, a podcast for the disruptive workplace leader. Join host Jessica Miller Merrill, founder of Workology.com, as she sits down and gets to the bottom of trends, tools, and case studies for the business leader, HR, and recruiting professional who is tired of the status quo. Now here's Jessica with this episode of Workology. Welcome to the Workology Podcast, sponsored by Clear Company. Private groups networks and communities are becoming the new norm and this is fundamentally changing how we interact with our job seeker candidates because the way job seekers interact with social media has evolved one example of what job seekers want from the candidate experience is one of my favorite facebook groups austin digital jobs it's a facebook group which has exploded to over 45,000 members in the past few years This is a moderated and supported group that offers resources to job seekers as well as a place for recruiters looking for employees and relationship building within the community. Today I'm joined by Lonnie Rosales. She's the Chief Operating Officer at the American Genius and founder of the Austin Digital Jobs Facebook group. Lonnie, welcome to the Workology Podcast. Thanks for having me. If you could see me, I'm waving my hands very enthusiastically. I'm very pumped about being here today. So thank you. Awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about Austin Digital Jobs Facebook group. I've used your Facebook group as an example frequently. I have posted jobs there and had really great success. It's it's good to talk to recruiters and HR about how social media has evolved and also how they can improve the candidate experience with social media and your group is sort of a living case study with feedback all the time from job seekers on their experience in the hiring process so for listeners who haven't heard of adj can you give us a little background on the group and maybe how it got started and what your thought process was if there was any yeah, there was. And it. I'll first start by saying it was never built to be something that scaled as, as big. So we had to kind of go backwards in time and, and figure some things out. But it was started in 2011. And what had happened was, um, particularly in the Marcom industry, we had a lot of senior level talent that was moving out of Austin that had moved here from other cities. And we just weren't um, doing a very good job of retaining them. It's not that there weren't jobs available, just they weren't finding them or we didn't really know what the problem was. I'm not in the industry. Um, I, I don't do hiring. So I just thought, well, let's just do a Facebook group because that's at the time where the masses were in bulk. Let's do a Facebook group and try to mind share. And so um, people would approach us pretty frequently um, and say, you're, you're so connected. Like, who do you know? And my answer was always I, like, um, I don't know because I can't remember. It's not my job. And I, so I, I had like a spreadsheet running for a while of like, which of my friends were hiring and who was looking, but you know, I wasn't getting paid and I didn't really have time to do that anyway. So I decided, um, with this group to just have a place for people to go to do that. I really anticipated that it would be, you know, maybe a hundred people at most, and it would probably be mostly high level tech and marketing and communications folks, but um, it pretty immediately grew really quickly. And so unlike anything else I've ever done in my life, I did absolutely no market research. I did no testing. It's just something that I just slapped together. And had I done that research, I would have realized there really wasn't a place that existed that was like this where recruiters and candidates were on a level playing field with each other in a non-threatening environment and a non-competitive environment. So different communities existed um, and in, even in Austin Tech, specifically networking groups offline, which has always been a strong suit of the Austin market, for example. But yeah, it's something that um, has really taken off and uh, just because of the hole in the market that didn't exist. Let's talk a little bit about your background in the digital space, because you said, you know, you're getting a lot of requests. Hey, who's hiring? What's going on? Connect me to people. What is the American genius? And then how did you arrive at the American Genius? Sure. So the American Genius was founded in 2006 um, by Ben Rosales, who I happen to be married to. (laughs) During the day, he's very much my boss and not my husband at all. He's very direct with me. Um, But he founded it and I was kind of helping on the side. I was actually in the commercial real estate industry and I was the marketing director for a firm. And 
he had me helping a little bit on the side. And um, I left the University of Texas with an English degree, which means you just have to get whatever job you get. And at the time, marketing was like, hey, you can come work for us <laughs> with an English degree. <laughs> so that's what I did. But Ben started the company. It's a national news network for entrepreneurs and for realtors. We have a separate division for realtors. And um, so it started off as a blog. And for anybody who's ever taken a blog to news, it's a really different format. There's all these different rules with Google. So um, we changed along the way, but originally it was a blog and it was a, um, a lot of writers joined in and we're just talking about different industry functions and best practices. And so my function at the company initially um, was to help grow the brand. And so branding and marketing was my first job title. And I, I worked my way up through the company. I'm, I now run operations as a COO. Um, which means I also get to oversee ADJ and Bash. And so the background gave me an immediate perspective in this group, the Austin Digital Jobs Group, that um, if I wanted to grow, which I realized I didn't have a choice pretty quickly, but if we wanted it to grow into something meaningful for the city, that's more than just a flash in the pan group that disappears quickly, that I would have to apply a lot of social media marketing tactics, which are a lot more organic and are a lot more, um, they feel more natural, but they're also very programmatic. So we do certain things every Monday. We do certain things every Wednesday, for example, and so on and so forth. So having a marketing background was a really unfair advantage in growing a group because I've done community management for long and done marketing for so long that it was something that I could do very quickly that somebody who didn't have the same background would have had to take a couple of years to build up. Plus I, I already had great connections in Austin and had some re name recognition. So the group started after kind of all that came together. So again, it's kind of an unfair advantage, but it did help to create something that's meaningful and free, like you said, for the community. So let's talk a little bit about bash, which is short for big ass social happy hour. <laughs> And I've been to Bash before, but that was actually before I moved to Austin. Yeah. Uh, so I need to I need to find some time to get back. But let's talk about Bash and how it's different, but sort of complementary to ADJ. Talk about that and and how it could, they kind of help each other or work together. Yeah. So this this goes back to kind of my statement earlier of starting things and not not thinking that they would grow, and they do. <laughs> so which is not the standard business problem, right? But um, so Bash actually started as the first tweet up in Austin. And there were several of us that put it together. And um, really at the time, you still, in 2007, you still didn't really meet people from the internet. There was still stranger danger. And we had all, there were maybe like 20 of us, 25 of us in Austin that had joined Twitter. Um, but it, Twitter didn't really take off outside of the tech community for the first year or two of its existence. And we just wanted to meet to face and see, are you a serial killer? Like, are you creepy or are you a real human? Are you actually a Dell executive or are you faking it? And so we just had a little um, group get together at Waterloo, which is a burger joint in Austin. And it was great. And then a couple weeks later, everybody started asking me, which it wasn't even exclusively my event, but everybody kept asking me, what are we doing this month? I was like, I don't, I already met you. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't need to meet you again. <laughs> like, so that's, that's really how it started. We realized that there was this burgeoning community online of people that are professional, that are using their real names, that want to network and connect, um, but they want to do it in kind of a casual, austin -y way, which, you know, a lot of cities have that casual vibe, right? So um, we, the original tagline was taking online offline and just encouraging people that were meeting on social media to get off of the computer and smartphone and go connect face to face. And so that's been going on for about almost 13 years now. And um, so that's a very um, steady monthly event here in Austin. And it's just, there's no speakers, you know, most people show up in like t-shirts and jeans or whatever. Um, Austin digital jobs was created after that. So we have a quarterly recruiting mixer, but Bash really complements it because we're trying to help people at any stage of their career to understand how important networking is. You can get a job from going to a networking event, but moreover, you're building your network for when you're ready to get that next job or you're, you know, looking to grow that and also have interactions with humans, which is great practice for people who don't do that frequently. And so it's had a really strong impact on helping the community to 
um, be maybe pulled somewhere that's a little uncomfortable. And um, it's run by people like me who are introverts and who are, you know, not really big crowd people anyways. Um, and just really trying to have a meeting place that's non-threatening to have people to go connect really casually and not be intimidated by that. And so it's helped people to A, get off the computer and B, to actually go network in a way that's more meaningful than just going to a bar and hoping you like talk to a stranger at some point. So they, they've turned on, they've really complimented each other very well. I think the success of the events that you do is because you're an introvert and you're very open about that. And I think it makes people feel comfortable. Like they may not be great with people and that's okay. And they can yeah. still get value from uh, in-person networking. Absolutely. Cause I usually tell them uh, if you think you're going to be weird at the event, trust me, I'm going to out weird you. I'm going to end up talking about like ghosts or something stupid. Nobody wants to talk about. So <laughs> I will out weird you. <laughs> and that's hard to do. I mean, Austin is the place where weird <laughs> happens like it that's a, a normal encouraged thing <laughs> it is what have you seen so so you have this unique perspective that as the sort of owner creator of the austin digital jobs group the, the cultivator of all these conversations and that are happening i mean they're organically but you're you're kind of monitoring the day-to-day -day and and mm -hmm. ongoing what kind of trends have you started to see in regards to the candidate experience when it comes to online and, and how have you seen that change uh, not just in Austin but um, maybe in, in the candidates themselves and the recruiters yeah so I think um, a couple things have changed um, first of all um, the level of information that is available is a lot in depth now and a lot more reliable and there's just a lot more of it um, you know 10 years ago when you googled it would mostly be like monster.com stuff on how to interview and it would be the same questions and the same responses and now there are so many active conversations for example in our group um, there are always active conversations at any time of people with really unique situations and we all learn from each other so I would say that the average candidate and the average employer or recruiter is is better informed now than a decade ago. So that that creates a in general, and that's not not that's not every market, that's not every single candidate or employer, of course. But in general, I do believe that people are better informed now. Another thing that we see that we and our unique perspective see probably a little bit differently than most is that the problem of ghosting of setting up an appointment and not showing up to a phone appointment, for example, is really common. And it's not just candidates, it's employers and recruiters as well. And so I hear complaints from all sides that that has increasingly gotten worse over the recent years. And so I find myself kind of mediating that a lot, trying to explain to candidates, you know, yeah, look, it happens. Sometimes people double book stuff, or sometimes there's a recruiter and a recruiting firm who's being asked to wear two and has way too many things on their plate or it's a you know employer that's a startup and they don't really know how to recruit yet like they're trying their best and so um, I, d I find myself defending that a lot but I also find myself defending candidates as well sometimes candidates misunderstood an email or sometimes you know candidates got overwhelmed or whatever it is so I've seen ghosting increase a lot so people are more informed but ghosting has increased and I would say that I think that there's a higher expectation from candidates on employers and vice versa because of that increased information level, right? So I believe that if somebody comes to an interview and they're completely uninformed about who a company is or what a company does, they don't get the job anymore. Whereas, you know, 20 years ago, it would be a learning opportunity. Now, if you can't Google it and you can't go on Glassdoor, then, you know, you really shouldn't can you even get a job? Like that's really basic stuff, right? Same with the candidates. There's so many research opportunities. So I, I would say some of the behavior has changed. I also think honestly, as a final point that um, candidates are ballsier now. I am shocked at some of the things that candidates say in public with their name about employers, whether past, present, or potential. And so I, I think that there's a lot of unmerited brave out there. So if if anybody that's listening is wondering, you know, what the hell is going on online? Why are these people so brave? It's not you. It's <laughs> that has definitely shifted. And uh, I would say that Reddit has kind of bled over into the mainstream uh, behavior in some aspects. So a lot has changed. Let's take a reset. This is Jessica Miller-Merrill, and you are listening to the Workology podcast sponsored by Clear Company. 
Today, we're talking about the online candidate experience with Lonnie Rosales. Podcast support provided by Clear Company, a complete talent management platform designed to help small and medium-sized companies hire, retain, and engage A players. Visit clearcompany.com to sign up for a free personalized demo. One of the things that I like about the Austin Digital Jobs Facebook group, and you alluded to it, is the group regularly puts employers and recruiters on blast for these bad tactics. So Mm -hmm. it's, they will post in the group and say, has anybody else had this experience at XYZ company? The recruiter isn't calling me back. So it's, it's kind of like real time engagement. Uh, You can find out like, yes, I'm experiencing the same thing at this employer too, in a way that you wouldn't get from like a glass door review. Yeah, and so it's it's gotten complicated, honestly, because we don't have the bandwidth, or I, to be frank, I don't have the bandwidth to police everything like that. So we actually implemented a rule where people can't name and shame. So if you want to name and shame, you can go to Glassdoor all day, or you can go complain on your own personal account, whatever. Uh, people can ask, are you experiencing X, Y, and Z, but they're no longer, and this has made it like my life so much easier, and I'm selfish, and that's really what I'm concerned with is my life, but it's made my life a lot easier because I don't have to police really subjective information that's being put out there. But we still have people that will, they'll call it, um, you know, the big fruit company, right? Like we know who you're talking about, but they're not naming it. And that's, people have kind of gotten away with that a little bit. Um, but they'll put the tactics on blast for sure. And so there's, I'll share an, a negative response and a positive response from companies and recruiters that have um, really been memorable. So one was, um, for example, um, they recently posted um, an unpaid internship, which is not allowed because A, it's not a job, and B, job implies they make money. So we've just been really strict on that. But somebody posted and they got deleted. And Facebook typically allows us an opportunity to send a private note explaining why it got deleted. And so we'll reference a rule and apologize. And we actually take a pretty soft stance on that because we know what it's like to join a group and just start posting because we're excited. So it happens. So this person decided that they would just wait a couple days and post it again. And um, then when it got deleted, they got angry, but they posted this unpaid internship on their own account and started commenting that ADJ is full of ungrateful people who don't like opportunities, but she made this post public. It was just the most bizarre thing ever. And so, um, I mean, I'm sure it's a neat opportunity, but it just, broke the rules. And so I didn't even know that it happened, but somebody found it. And then all these people flooded to her personal Facebook account. Again, I wasn't involved. I didn't, I was at work. I didn't even know any of this was happening. And I got this nasty note from her saying, you know, I can't believe you sicked your dogs on me. And I was like, okay, whoa, whoa, what happened? Like, I haven't been around. I don't even know what's going on. And so I had to research and figure out what's going on. And you know, that was just a scenario where she started responding to each and every single person and you're stupid and called somebody retarded. And it was just, oh my God, it was the most ridiculous thing I had ever seen. And just sometimes when you get deleted in a group, you should just let it, let it on, go. Right? Let it, well, <laughs> let it go. Yeah. Go try another group um, or, you know, get, get your feelings hurt. And that happens every Or learn from it. Um, so that was a that, yeah, learn from it would be good. I don't see that one as often, but um, so that was a really negative one. A positive one um, was a company posted something that wasn't really relevant. It was like medical billing or something. And typically those people will get banned from the group because they're new and they immediately post something that's not relevant. And um, so one person posted medical billing or something, got deleted. They came back to the Facebook group in public, instead of responding to the private message that we had sent them apologizing and explaining the rules and was talking about, you know, why would you delete me? I was offering a job. And so of course, everybody in the group and ADJ is really um, full of so many like really tight knit loyal people. They don't all know each other, but we're all kind of in the same little weird boat together. And so they're very defensive of the group. So they attacked. And normally when you get attacked, what happens is you get defensive and you do what the other lady did. F you, F this, you know, screw you, this group's stupid. That's kind of the standard. But this person said, you know, oh, I, I really didn't mean to overstep. Um, we do have tech jobs because these are tech and Marcom jobs. We do have tech jobs. Um, if anybody wants to talk to me about these three developer roles, 
you know, would that be okay? And so everybody was like, yeah. And he was able to kind of learn from it and pivot in a way that didn't make him look stupid. And we, we left the post because he ended up, you know, connecting with people and, you know, other members encouraged him. Why don't you just go post that individually? But he didn't cuss at anybody. He just said, okay, well, um, I didn't know. And now I understand and offered something of value instead of just getting defensive. But man, I tell you, nobody likes being called out and we've stopped the name calling for individual brands, but behaviors are still called out pretty frequently. And we leave a lot of this commentary there for employers specifically to see because sometimes people are very overreactive. Sometimes people are easy to trigger with very simple things. And it's actually a really great way to see how your candidate is going to behave in a social environment, in a work environment, in a pressure environment, any of those sort of things without in, even in, before you even engage them. So we, we leave all that there so everybody can see. <laughs> it's helpful. I got, I got to imagine that moderation is a lot of work. I mean, you have 45,000 members. How do you manage all that in, in such a large Facebook group? So um, being from the marketing community, this is where it was a huge advantage. Um, we knew right away on how, based on how quickly it was growing that we would have to have really stringent rules, a very laser focus of what's allowed, right? Because typically what happens in a group is you start it and you kind of let the community build itself. And we did that, but um, we also knew that we would have to have very clear parameters. It's really, it is unfair that some groups, even large groups don't have ultra clear, like our parameters are so clear. We have a freaking flow chart and you have to like follow the flow chart and see, can I even post this? So that's been um, there since um, the first year and we've updated it and whatnot, but having a flow chart of rules has been huge because we can literally just delete, 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 delete. And we delete 25% of everything posted and we offer a kind note. Cause again, we know what it's like to just get excited and post something um, or accidentally post it in the wrong place or whatever. But I did have to break down and um, a little over a year ago, bring on some trusted individuals that wanted to volunteer to moderate and um, they're in the industry as well. Um, and specifically marketing, more of them are in Marcom than, and none of them are recruiters. They're also not in competition with anybody, but we really highly rely on the community. And I think any group that is larger has to do that and has to train people from day one that we will respect when you report something to us. Uh, we may not tell you if we deleted it or not, but that we do want them to tell us. We do want them to report things. Otherwise, with so much volume, we might not even see it. I literally can't read every single thing that goes on the group. It's just too much. Um, but it's changed over time uh, because Facebook has kind of changed some of their parameters and the rules. And so that's changed a little bit. But um, to moderate it really is... It's not even about um, any skill. It's just about being vigilant, having laser focus um, with the rules and empowering the community themselves to be vigilant as well and give them the ownership of what is allowed and what is not allowed. What a great opportunity for for volunteers within the community to help moderate because not everybody gets to be involved in such a large group like that um, on a platform, whether it's Facebook or somewhere else. No, that's true. And we actually have a small Facebook chat group with um, there's four and then me. So there's five of us total that are moderating the group and um, we've actually become pretty close. I mean, we're in that chat group every single day, even if nothing screwy is going on in the group. <laughs> so it's, uh, that's been a fun bonding experience. So I don't, if you ask me this again in a year, I'll have no idea what my answer will be because at some point I probably need to add more moderators, but we have such a like tight knit group right now. I don't really know how that would work. So <laughs> we'll see. Well, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, the candidate experience. So mm -hmm. if you could speak a little to maybe recruiters who are listening or HR people who are lurking and listening, um, what is one thing advice maybe you would give them uh, on how to engage in a group like ADJ or just on social media in general with job seekers? Yeah, I think that's a really important question and one that um, has changed pretty dramatically over time. Um, strategies that worked a decade ago just simply don't work today. Part of the secret sauce of our group is that when someone posts, they're posting with their personal Facebook account and they can say, hey, don't DM me, like email me or whatever. 
but there's a human face to it. And candidates have become um, really highly engaged when they can basically make eye contact over the computer. And so, yeah, they can Google the company. They can maybe figure out who the team is if the company even shows the team on their website. Um, but any ways that they can make eye contact over the computer, so to speak. So instead of just posting on the job search sites, instead of just posting on the company LinkedIn, it's extremely helpful for the recruiters and employers themselves to post on their own LinkedIn accounts, to post on their own Facebook accounts, or wherever it makes sense where they do that kind of business um, that gives their profile picture right next to it. Um, so that's been something that um, still is, especially in different sectors, like the financial sector, for example, that's that's still something that an entire sector has. A, and that's, that's okay. I mean, I think that's a different ball of wax because it's so highly regulated. Mm -hmm. But for, you know, groups like tech, where you can do that and be human, any opportunity to be human. And it's, it's been surprising to me, I get emails or direct messages when people get a kind note after an interview with any sort of feedback, that's become so rare. And it's, it's probably not really rare with your listeners, because people that are listening in are studying and are thinking through these things. But in general, if that's something that's rare, then we kind of have a problem. They're already used to the automated rejections and the automated responses. So anything above and beyond kind of like that automated canned notification, which by the way, even those are still kind of crap. Like those don't have any brand information, any community resources, any way to like talk to a human. There's no like appeals process or anything. It's just, uh, you know, a thumbs down over email. So any chance to be human um, you would think that social media would have made that the norm by now, but it still hasn't. We've, we've started to rely on these automation tools because we're inundated. If we post something, we're going to get 500 applications, right? So especially after an interview or an in-person interaction or even a phone interview, just taking that extra step to be human, that's so rare these days that it really helps a brand or um, an employer to stand out. So one of the examples that you just gave it, for the candidate experience sounds like being responsive. You know? Yeah. Having an email that somebody actually reads or maybe calling a job seeker or finding something, even if it's automated, but is a little bit more personal when you send, down, send out a turn down notice or you let them know that you've received their application. Just yeah. kind of some little things. What are some other maybe ideas that you have? Because again, this is ADJ, you get to see a lot of different, I don't know, just situations or uh, challenges that candidates have are facing. What are some things that recruiters and, and companies can do better with? Yeah, I think um, two things come to mind. Um, in any of the automation tools where another human is sent a message without any human oversight or activity or personalization, I've seen some companies have some good success with success, pardon me, with sounding human by offering more options. Um, so like knowing what the local resources are. So for example, there are plenty of employers here in ADJ, I mean, in Austin, pardon me, that part of their um, automated response, whether it's a rejection or otherwise, will say, here's some networking groups that in the meantime, while we review, here's some networking groups that are relevant to our industry. Here are some Facebook groups and just offering some resources and empowering them. Um, that's even that stands out so much because they're used to just the automated, like thumbs up, thumbs down. Right. Um, so that's one. Um, and, and really just being um, as humans involved in more networking events. And I'm always surprised um, if I walk around the room and I see maybe two recruiters but tons of candidates. I'm like, wow, they're, especially when there's so many senior level people in a room, it's just a huge missed opportunity. And so um, I, I ask them often, what events do they go to? And it tends to be recruiting oriented, most of them. So getting out into the community and just spending time getting to know who these people are can be, in my opinion, again, I'm not, I'm not a hiring manager. I'm not in the industry, but I just see so few of that, so few people doing that actively um, and only doing it when they have a, a strong need for a specific type of candidate instead of doing it just regularly. So I think having better automated responses that engage candidates and remember that 
what that candidate experience is and remembering how, yeah, this could be somebody that's employed, but it could be somebody who's in an extremely toxic environment that just it desperately wants out or somebody who's been unemployed for two years and would literally do anything to be recognized and just remembering those feelings. So the third thing I would say is um, going through the application process at other places. Um, that's something that Ben makes us all do annually. We all have to apply somewhere else and see what that feels like awesome. and remember what that process feels like and whether it's, do we, is it still inhuman? Is it still kind? What is the tone? What has changed? And uh, plus it makes us feel lucky that we all have jobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, Facebook groups because I think that HR and recruiters oftentimes are a little bit hesitant to be on Facebook, probably because they have to use their real Facebook account mm -hmm. versus uh, hiding behind a, a brand. Although I've, I have some friends who have a personal Facebook that, you know, as a friend I'm connected to, and then they have their work recruiter Facebook uh, account, which I'm not necessarily a fan of. But uh, can you talk a little bit about maybe the reason behind public or private Facebook groups for you are, which is ADJ and then where, where do you sit? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Yeah. So um, our group, because of the nature of people looking in secret, um, we keep it as a closed group. It's completely closed. So unless you're a member, you can't see who's in it. You can't see anything going on in it. You have to be approved and join the group to be able to know anything. I think for, our, our industry and our community, I think having closed groups, private groups is really important. And also we go out of our way to protect um, any members that have questions. So we have anonymous questions every day. And that's literally just people direct messaging me as the admin with a question and me putting it out there for them so they don't have to out themselves. But I, I think when it's when it's somebody's a recruiter and they want to join a group, some of them do the, the personal and private accounts. I, I think that... The reason that I don't really encourage that, e even though I know a lot of people do it, is because if a candidate looks up your name and there's more than one account, then it's like, well, okay, wait, are you real? Are you even real? Like, oh, are you a spoof of somebody's account? And yep. that account is the real one, the one where I can see all the kids' pictures and stuff. And this, you know, one that doesn't even have a cover photo looks fake. Um, so if it's something that you feel really compelled to do, I would definitely make it as realistic as possible and kind of update it with, you know, relevant work stuff. That's fine. Have a cover photo, that kind of thing. Um, it also just, it's got, it just takes extra work to have it separated out. But one of the great things about Facebook groups that I do that people that post in any group do have the capacity to turn off comments. And if you explain why you're doing that, when you do that, you know, Hey, I don't use Facebook a whole lot, but I wanted to let you guys know what was going on. You can email me anytime at X, Y, and Z. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn off comments because I don't want to miss anything that you're saying. That way you still put that information in a group, whether it's public or private. It's, it can still be your personal account. That way, if somebody direct messages you, you're not expected to respond. You already told them to email you. And if they can't follow directions, they're not going to follow directions when you want to hire them anyway. So don't talk to them. <laughs> that's, my, that's my feeling on that. <laughs> I like how you're like, hey, I can't respond. Like, I want to, I want to hear everything you have to say. Email me. Uh, it's yeah. a nice way of saying, hey, here's, here's an. Sorry, I can't talk right now. Here's another option for you. Yeah, it's kind of like an online voicemail that anybody can listen to. That's why my voicemail says, please text me. <laughs> I just keep my voicemail full. That that gets the point across. <laughs> <laughs> Then they just message you on Facebook. Oh, that's true. <laughs> How many messages do you get a day on Facebook? Um, oh my God. So did you know that Facebook notifications actually maxes out around 99? So it'll say 99 plus, but it doesn't always load more. <laughs> so sometimes if I get more than 99, so if I don't use Facebook for a full day, whether it's a weekday or weekend, I will max out and I won't see a bunch of stuff that happened. So I even run a Chrome script and this is so mean, but just anybody that's highly active on Facebook, this is kind of a neat little tip. It's a Chrome extension called Hide Likes and Notifications. And so anytime you open up your notifications, somebody liking something isn't one of them. So you only see when people have commented or when people have made a real interaction. Um, so that's been a huge time saver for me. Uh, I feel badly about it. Not that I don't want people to like stuff, but and I don't, yeah, I, I average several hundred messages when it comes to direct messages. 
I probably average around a hundred at this point because I've gotten better at kind of narrowing that down. Um, but email, don't even ask me about email. I'm the main point of contact for the entire company. So I get several hundred of those a day. <laughs> wow. I like this Chrome script. So I want to check it out because when you manage like a bunch of groups or a yeah. bunch of Facebook pages, it gets out of control. It does. And then especially if you max out, you miss stuff. You, sometimes it maxes out, sometimes it doesn't, but I find more frequently that it maxes out and you cannot see. So like you said, if you're moderating multiple communities or you're involved in multiple communities, because if you comment on something and people like your comment on that over and over, you're getting a bunch of fluff notifications that aren't really helpful. Facebook needs to add that feature in for everyone as like a settings option. Facebook needs to do a whole lot of stuff, but they stopped listening to me a long time ago. <laughs> Like, ah, what does she know? She just has a really big group about the job seekers and recruiters talk to each other. No, they're just so tired of me complaining. They're like, I, I know they're all sitting around thinking, then why don't you just leave? Like, if you hate us so much, go away. <laughs> well, what advice can you leave us with for HR and recruiting leaders? Like, let's say that they want to understand more. I mean, I hope that they do uh, because that's what this podcast episode is all about, how to understand what job seekers want from the candidate experience, but what's maybe one thing that they can take away, uh, maybe just get started in maybe improving their candidate experience, not as a large company, but maybe just as an individual contributor at their company. Yeah. So I, I think there's a lot of power in social media communities and whether um, you're acting as an individual or on behalf of your company, um, the main advice I have, which sounds super intuitive, but is so rarely used is look before you leap and you would be shocked how many people don't read the room before they get involved. And again, I know what it's like. I, I've joined, you know, like um, moms walking in Austin or whatever, and then ask, does anybody want to go walking? And they're like, yeah, you're stupid. Like we have a whole thread for that and like getting yelled at. So looking before you leap. And I think that's also true in LinkedIn groups, Facebook groups. Um, engaging on Twitter, really anything where you're using your name or your brand name to engage. And um, especially um, today, because the levels of information are so much higher, which empower everybody, but it also kind of makes people shittier sometimes and just so much sassier than is necessary. And so um, I like to tell people that are new specifically to our group, for example, to spend an hour reading through um, comments and posts before you ever post anything, um, or maybe observe for a couple of days and see kind of how the mood changes over time. Um, but I, I think that's really true of um, LinkedIn groups as well, really anywhere that you're going to engage. Spend a lot of time really studying before you get involved because if you do that, you'll kind of know what the shortcuts are pretty quickly. And further, I would, I'm always flattered when an employer reaches out to me saying, Hey, I'm new to the group. Do you have any, you know, best practices tips for me? And I'm always happy to direct message like, yeah, here's kind of where the culture is right now. Here's what we're finding works really well. Um, you know, for example, I can tell them what kind of imagery is working well right now versus a GIF or whatever. Um, so engaging the people that are leading these communities, some of them are going to ignore you because they think they're really important and they don't realize they're just um, a skin bag with a bunch of bones in it. But the majority will be helpful and responsive and helping you to utilize that community. And most of them are free. So these free resources, it's wild. I, I'm, I'm shocked when people don't use free resources like this that they're <laughs> because they think, oh, it's Facebook. That's stupid. Well, okay, it's Facebook with almost 50,000 people sitting there with 65% of them currently employed, passively looking. Like, those are desirable people. You should be there. <laughs> well, and, and I find that so many employers and HR and recruiters are looking for feedback. And mm -hmm. this is a great place to sort of, you don't have to even participate. You can just watch and learn yep. and understand. And you get that feedback in a way maybe that you haven't in the past. Because we're not very good about asking for, for feedback um, as companies who are recruiting and hiring. Yeah. And I think if something doesn't exist in your city, um, you know, the startup community is a really great place to tap for partnering, um, especially marketing and communication people in the startup world. They're always looking to build stuff. You know, you can always build it in conjunction with somebody. You have the expertise on the industry. They have the expertise on how to build community and together building something meaningful for the city. It's, it's, it's not difficult. It just takes a whole lot of time. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> well, hey, that's it, right? Yeah, just do the thing. If you, if you can do something and execute, then you can do it. It's not difficult. <laughs> 
Well, Lonnie, thank you for taking time to talk with us today. Where can people go to connect with you and, and learn more about ADJ and American Genius and on all the things that you're working on? All the things. So the AmericanGenius.com slash about. I think that kind of has all the links in one place and tells you a little bit about each piece of the moving puzzle that we're working on. And uh, the organization is national, but our events are all in Austin. So if you're in Austin, we'd love to see you. And Jessica, I would like for you to come back to Bash, please. That would be great. God, I can't <laughs> believe I've been here two years, but and I need to. I, so I will see you at the next Bash. And thank you for the, taking the time to talk with us. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. The evolution of the Candidate Experience Align is so evident in the growth of Facebook groups like Austin Digital Jobs, or ADJ for short. These communities can be excellent educational experiences for recruiters who want to know what job seekers are looking for in a specific sector or geographic location. I've been a follower and a commenter on ADJ since I moved to Austin, and I have seen so much growth in this community over the past few years. I'm so glad to have the chance to talk to Lonnie, about her group and get her thoughts on what we should be doing as HR and recruiting leaders when it comes to social media and social networking. Thank you for joining the Workology podcast sponsored by Clear Company. This podcast is for the disruptive workplace leader who's tired of the status quo. This is Jessica Miller Merrill. Until next time, visit workology.com to listen to all our previous podcast episodes.